it has been a long time since I've done a power ranking. I mean, last time I did it was week number one of the season, and I had the Suns somewhere down at number 10 because of their 1-3 and three start. I had the Cavs down at 23. They're a lot higher today, and it's been, it's been a while, you know? I thought I was going to do this every week, and it definitely has not happened this way, and... Uh, today I figured I might as well just talk about a little bit about each team and just do a, a quick synopsis of what I'm seeing in each of these teams and just kind of rank them. And this, all this is just my opinion, you're definitely going to disagree with me in points in this video. I'm just throwing out my take and what I see in each of these teams because I don't really get the chance to talk about them every day. Well, I mean, I just don't choose to talk about them every day, but I want to talk about all of them. Uh, the teams are kind of ranked based off of standings and then chance to win the championship and then chance to uh succeed in the playoffs like those are the three factors that kind of go into it and deciding like uh, how i ranked these teams so let's just start it off with phoenix suns they're number one i think this is fairly obvious i've made so much content about the suns you can look anywhere on my channel to see more of me talking about the suns but this team is great i don't think anyone can really surpass them as the number one seed even with chris paul being out until the re end of the regular season Devin Booker is going to be looking to make a big MVP case as the Suns will probably continue to succeed without Chris Paul. And I don't think there's a shadow of a doubt, like everyone in their right mind should be thinking the Suns are making the conference finals and I accidentally scrolled backwards. Everyone should think the Suns are making the conference finals. I think it's almost guaranteed at this point, virtually guaranteed unless the entire team like just ceases, ceases to exist. They will make the conference finals. They will likely make the finals. And that simply just gives them the best odds of winning the championship, even if they weren't already the best team. And Chris Paul has all the time in the world to recover before the finals, so or before the playoffs even, because that's when he's going to come back. Uh, this team's easily the best in the league. N n enough set here. The Warriors at two, uh, they're just the second best team in the league in terms of just playing good basketball. I mean, maybe the Eastern Conference teams can be more like talented. In terms of just types of players they have and just dominance players the warriors just play a really high brand of basketball really great brand of basketball and i almost also want to you know guarantee them as a western conference finals participant especially if draymond green is healthy i think we can almost certainly lock it in and if you're giving me a theoretical 50 50 chance that it's going to be either the suns or warriors to make the finals it's hard to put any eastern conference team above the warriors who have like a guaranteed shot of making the western conference finals Main storyline with the Warriors will be monitor monitoring the health of Draymond Green, Klay Thompson who has been playing but he hasn't looked great, and James Wiseman going forward because those are three important key pieces to actually giving this team a shot against the Phoenix Suns. And can they even win consistently without Draymond Green for the time being? Can they keep? Can they even keep up with the Suns without Chris Paul? I don't know about that. They've been struggling, they've dropped quite a few games, and we'll just have to see what happens. Uh, but the Warriors have something to prove. Draymond Green should be back soon, but when's James Wiseman returning? That size issue is one of the biggest things for the Suns, uh, for the Warriors that could be really messing them up. I'm going to say the Suns a lot because I've been talking about only the Suns. So uh, let's just move on to number three, the Heat. I've been talking about this. The Heat just have a really great, talented team and a really great coach. The main issue they can't be the best team in the league right now is due to their half-court offense. It's just one of the statistically worst ones in the NBA. It's really confusing when you look at just uh, how talented this team is. And just all the factors are there for them to be successful. They just can't figure it out between all the pieces they have. And... Uh, yeah, it's just the Heat are confusing and... They need to figure things out, but just due to that, them having the best record in the East and just being great defensively and just being a team that should theoretically work itself out. Like, you already have the best record. The team's only getting more healthy. I can only see them doing well in the Eastern Conference. They play some really great basketball at times during the season, but they just haven't been overly consistent. It's been the same story with this Heat team during the regular season 2019 or, you know, the regular season during the bubble year. Last year, very inconsistent. This year, once again, very inconsistent. And if they can find some health and just, just you know, put themselves together, uh, this team should be good, but they've still got to prove that. And they really don't want to see the Bucks in the second round, which is very likely considering 
The Bucks are currently sitting tied third in the Eastern Conference. I think they're technically fifth due to tiebreakers. And the storyline for them is Brooke Lopez's availability because Pat Connaughton's out until the end of the season, if not later. And uh, DiVincenzo was just traded, so you already have deficits at the guard depth. And then you're losing Brooke Lopez, one of your you know key pieces who's been starting pretty much every single game he's been with the team. You know, that hurts. And this team's really suffered in terms of depth due to injuries all season long. And now they've got some long-term injuries that they can't really solve that easily. Maybe something pops up on the uh, the buyout market, but the Bucks' main issue is that depth and just dealing with injuries. And otherwise, the Bucks are still a great team. We know they're the biggest threat in the Eastern Conference. They just made the finals, and no one can really stop Giannis. So no one wants to play the Bucks. I'd have to say in that Eastern Conference. I don't think anyone wants to play the Sixers either. Storyline of the team is going to be James Harden. They're also tied with the Bucks at two and a half games behind in the Eastern Conference. Joel Embiid's been going crazy, and really no one can stop him. Like, no one can really stop him except for maybe Jared Allen, which really, that would be a bad scenario for the Sixers if they have to go up against the Cavs in the first round, which seems likely because they're going to, both those teams are going to finish between third and sixth in the Eastern Conference. And that might be the biggest that might be the biggest deal for the Sixers to take on a team that is so good fundamentally defensively, and it also has the good one-on-one -on -one matchups you need to take on the Sixers with Isaac Okoro and with Jared Allen matching up against the Sixers two stars. The Cavs might be looking at a potential upset pick if they were up against the Sixers. And I think the Sixers have to watch out for them. The Bucks as well, if Giannis just tries to go one-on-one -on -one against uh, Joel. Joel is probably going to struggle a bit in that matchup. Uh, and... Yeah, just the Sixers, they've got a lot of talent, but I just see a really tough Eastern Conference, and I cannot say that they're, I am more confident in this team than I am in these other teams, like, you know, the Bucks and the Heat. Let's go to another Eastern Conference team, a fourth straight Eastern Conference team, the Chicago Bulls. Storyline is going to be, of course, Lonzo Ball and Alex Caruso. Uh, uh, the story is really, you know, Lonzo Ball and Alex Caruso. I'm sorry, just a little bit distracted here. Uh, those two players returning from injury has taken away from, you know, quite a bit of talent at the guard position, but we've seen Ayo Sumu and DeMar DeRozan really step up in their absence, which has been fan fantastic to see for the Bulls. And... Uh, the main thing for me is the Bulls, they've done a great job of winning games. How are they going to fare in a playoff series if we put them against the Sixers, if we put them against the Bucks, if we put them against, you know, uh, just one of these teams in the Eastern Conference? Let me know. What do you guys think? Are the Bucks going to get out of it alive? Like, are the Bucks actually going to win these playoff series against these teams? I'm not, like, confident at this point. So, like, I think they've got a lot to prove once we see them in the playoffs. And I've said this, like, all the time during my last year's power rankings. Uh, with these teams like the Bulls that are just kind of newly constructed and we've never seen them, like, perform in the playoff level, you just kind of don't know what you're going to get. And we just yet to see how it's going to shape out with this Bulls team. They haven't made the playoffs yet, so uh, let's see what they do once they are in the playoffs. Let's see it before we can believe it. The Grizzlies at 7. The storyline is Jaron Jackson being good. I'm still a little bit questionable of how people are treating him as such a great player. I don't really totally see it yet. Like, I see the potential, but I just do not see what people see in him right now. But otherwise, there isn't a whole lot of storylines uh, surrounding this team. Dylan Brooks hopefully can be back to really give them an, a very talented player to really uh, just stack the depth of this team. But Desmond Bain John Morans has just been a great tandem at the guard positions. It's made them nearly unstoppable. You need Dylan Brooks to step up, and he needed uh, DeAnthony Melton. Man, so many people were jumping on the DeAnthony Melton hype train this offseason and during the beginning of the season. And Melton's just really fallen off a cliff since that point. So you probably want to see Melton really step up and do some great stuff, because he can do some great stuff. It's just hasn't happened in a while. The Celtics at eight. The storyline has to be their red hot hot streak. Like, there's a reason they're here at eight randomly when they're six in the Eastern Conference, four and a half games behind. It's because the Celtics have been statistically a top five team in basketball over the past month. And I think adding in players like Derek White and Daniel Tice are 
going to be some pretty good additions. Like, Derek White is exactly what they need as a very great defensive guard, maybe even an all-defensive guard. And he's done a solid job at shooting the basketball, can do some shot creation stuff. You add in Daniel Tice, who's been a good piece for them when he's been on the team. You know, he just, he's only been away from the team for, you know, how many months? Like, it has only been a few months since we've seen with the Celtics, and we know he does good stuff for the Celtics. They're a really scary offensive team to face in the playoffs. They have so much offensive firepower, and they're not exactly an enviable matchup for whoever pulls the Celtics in the playoffs. Uh, the Cavs end up at number nine. The storyline, there's really not a whole lot to talk about the Cavs. They've just been so fantastic. Very few issues. The main things to be looking at with the Cavs is going to be Karis LeVert's offensive integration and Isaac Okoro also on the offensive end really stepping up. Uh, it's just about those two things. Otherwise, the Cavs just look very complete and they have a very high potential of upsetting someone in the Eastern Conference. Even if they do end up like a third seed, everyone will be betting against the Cavs, and I think the Cavs got the talent to get it done. But just like the Bulls, it's going to be a prove-it thing with the Cavs. They've got to prove how good they can be in the playoffs before I can be like 120% confident in them. you got to prove it first, and the Cavs are going to have a great opportunity to do so. There's a lot of talent in the Eastern Conference, and if they can come away with a series win against any of those teams, then they're going to be a big player in the East for years to come. The Jazz at 10. I, I have to drop them down. The storyline perimeter defense. No one on the perimeter can get a stop. And just Rudy Gobert has got to try to pick up the pieces. There's only so much Rudy Gobert can do. And I've seen, you know, we've seen people blame stuff on Rudy Gobert. It's like, it's just ridiculous because it's not Gobert's fault for how bad this defense has been. It's because of these bad perimeter defenders who cannot stop anyone. They have not fixed this issue either. So the Jazz still have their issues. They didn't fix them in free agency. They didn't really fix them in the trade deadline. I mean, Nikhil Alexander-Walker should be a help, but who even knows how much Nikhil Alexander-Walker plays when you already have like a three-man guard core has been almost doing everything for your team during the last few seasons with Conley, Mitchell, and Clarkson taking up all your guard minutes over like the past years. Does not even figure his way into that rotation? I don't know. But you, if you don't stop dudes on the perimeter, you will not make it out of the West Western Conference. It's as simple as that. That's why this Jazz have to be dropped down. I don't care how good statistically they've been over the past few years. If you're not stopping drives off the perimeter, you're not getting anywhere close to winning a championship. You're probably not even winning a playoff series, if I had to guess. Like, I would guess they would lose to a team like the Dallas Mavericks, who have a lot of guys who do like to attack the rim. I mean, they're not exactly the best team in the league at attacking the rim and driving that sort of thing, but they've got guys who are willing to do it. Storyline for the Mavericks is going to be that Porzingis trade. I really don't think they got the value back that they needed, especially because Spencer Dinwiddie didn't make a ton of sense for me. Like, you've got basically another Jalen Brunson, just worse. And it's just like, why? Why did you do that? <laughs> when you could have traded for a guy like Kyle Kuzma, or Daniel Gafford, or Thomas Bryant, who have been far more useful for this Mavericks team. I have no freaking clue why Spencer Dinwiddie was in this trade as the primary asset. I don't, I think Davis Bertans was the other player in that trade. Uh, no clue why Spencer Dinwiddie was the guy. Uh, I mean, just keep being consistent. That's the main thing with the Mavericks. Keep the defense going and maybe get Donja some better looks, but that seems pretty hopeless. I mean, they could beat the Jazz, but I really don't see much playoff hope for any team not named the Sons of the Warriors, and the Mavericks are certainly included in that category. Very flawed team. They've been inconsistent up until the last few months, and I think they're going to really be exploited in the playoffs for a lot of their issues that they have right now. The Nets at 12, I've talked about them recently. The main thing is Ben Simmons. I, I've seen a lot of people writing it off as Ben Simmons is an amazing addition for this Nets team. Who knows? We've never seen Ben Simmons play in this type of role ever in his entire career. Uh, there's these people who just think, oh, Ben Simmons plays good on this team on 2K. And for some reason, that's good enough justification for them to think Ben Simmons is a perfect fit with this Nets team. He's, I mean, I don't know yet. We've never seen him play with the Nets, but I am extremely doubtful of how well this fit's going to work. And they've really got to figure things out, especially with KD out for still quite a, maybe a few more weeks. Joe Harris might be out for maybe the entire season, but we'll see. Maybe he does return by the playoffs. What is going on at center? There's like five or six different guys that are competing for minutes. I have no clue what's going on. 
Uh, I'm just not very high on this Nets team. There's a lot of confusion at guard as well, adding Goran Dragic and Seth Curry in when you already have Patty Mills. And I'm just confused with this team. I'm not very high on them. I don't think they're that great of a team. Uh, I just don't see it. I don't see how they could potentially be the number one in playoff odds or in terms of odds to win the championship at all. I don't understand that. Uh, the main thing that they have for this going for them is KD is amazing. But otherwise, the Nets, I just do not see what people see in this Nets team. It's just not there for me. Kyrie Irving's working a part-time job. He's there half the games. On top of all of that, like, it's it's frustrating to be looking at this Nets team from the outside. Just looking at, okay, I think this team could be managed quite a bit better, I'd have to, I'd have to say. And Steve Nash has been very questionable as a coach, especially with these types of players he's working with. It has been very questionable, and I don't think Nash can really bring out the best of these players. I just think this is a very bad situation for Nash. And yeah, just overall, I don't really see this Nets team being that great of a team. The Nuggets at 13. Storylines, the guard play. I think this is kind of like the thing you've heard again, again, and again with this team. The guard play is so bad with this team. Like, I think the best guards on this team are Monty Morris and Rookie Bones Highland. Like, uh, th even that is just not good guard play for the Western Conference. You don't have playoff hope without guard play. I don't care how good Jokic is. Aaron Gordon's been playing pretty good, but the team just sucks outside of those two players. And Jokic is good enough to drag this team to number 13. Like, that's how great Jokic is. But the rest of the team just sucks. They didn't improve their roster. There's not really a ton of hope for this Nuggets team. Simple as that. The Raptors at 14, I think the storyline is really going to be about OG and uh, Anunobi and with those three, four lineups between uh, Barnes, Pascal, and OG. Like, you really want those three guys on the floor together because they are your three best forwards. There's not really, none of those centers are anywhere close to your three forwards in terms of talent and this usefulness on the court, but... It just They just haven't worked yet. They're negative 1.8 in the 570 minutes those three players have shared the court together. In their most used lineup with those three players, I believe they're minus 1.5 in 300 minutes. And it's just not been great when those three are on the court together. You want that to go way up, and it just hasn't yet. Especially, even though they're 32 and 25, they have a positive record. To have a negative net rating with your best players on the floor is not a great look. I mean, granted, the Suns did have that during last year's uh, season, but still, it's just not a good look. Scotty Barnes and Gary Trent Jr. have been fantastic this season and defied people's expectations, and they're a really sneaky good team rising in the standings. It's just that main kind of issue that's holding me back from being extremely confident in the Raptors. Also, they still don't really have a true number one option, which, I mean, that's been the main thing, the main reason why they haven't been successful since Kawhi left. Well, maybe Scotty Barnes can evolve into that player. Who knows? The Timberwolves at 15. There's no storyline. Like, this is a good team. Just keep it going on both ends. There's a lot of good things going on for the Timberwolves. You got good defense. Jared Vanderbilt looked great. You're harness, har harnessing Pat Bev's defensive abilities, which is also a smart idea. They've just got to stay healthy and take advantage of the teams that aren't healthy in the Western Conference. And just let's just win some games. Under the radar, sneak some in. Probably not going to be successful in the playoffs, as I said again and again. It's going to be those two teams running the West. So just sneak in, you know, put your point, put your place in, get into the playoffs and get out pretty much. <laughs> it's as simple as that. The Hawks at 16, the storyline's been their health, particularly with DeAndre Hunter. Uh, with DeAndre Hunter's return, I think this could really change the course of the entire season for the team. He just looks really good. And they're right now tied in ninth in the Eastern Conference. Their offense has been great, but adding in a piece like DeAndre Hunter, who's a very fantastic defender, can really help out their struggling defense. I believe they're either 29th or 30th in the NBA in defense. So Hunter can really help them out and change how the season's going for the Hawks. They really need his help. And he's also a really solid offensive asset as well. So Hunter can really turn the tables. He looked amazing last year before he got injured. Like, he looked insane for a second year player really flew under the radar in terms of how good he looked before getting injured last regular season and yeah he just really hasn't returned to that form until now you'd have to hope because he did come back during the playoffs and just really did not look like the same player at all before he got re-injured the clippers at 17 their storyline is winning without stars can they get it done without their three best players now they've lost norman powell with a broken foot 
and they've lost Kawhi Leonard, there's no hope of him returning, and they've lost Paul George, there's also very little hope of him returning. So, can they really make it work? Can they even win in the play-in game if they're still stuck there? I'm not confident in that, but they have done a solid job at winning games without stars. But I, I just have to be doubtful of winning a play-in game or even winning a playoff series against the Suns or Warriors. It's just not going to happen with this Clippers team. The Hornets at 18. The storyline is Gordon Hayward's health. I think that's one, been one of the biggest things for this Hornets team is losing that that veteran guy who really stabilizes the team. They've been very over-reliant on big performances from their stars with Lamelo Ball, Terry Rozier, and Miles Bridges to win games. And they've just been inconsistent on both ends. They've been one of the worst defenses in the league. James Borrego's defense has dropped off a cliff since we talked about it like last season in the middle of the year. It's just been so terrible. Like he brought it back at the beginning of the season. Like it looked like a solid defense again. Then it's gone again. And yeah, they need to find some sort of consistency. They're just going to keep dropping the Eastern Conference. And yeah, it's a rough situation for the Hornets. They've still got time. They've still got a whole lot of years left in LaMelo Ball's career. But right now, it is not the time for the Hornets to be successful. The Lakers at 19 storyline is the chaos that is going on between LeBron James, Clutch Sports, and the front office and everything that is going on. I have no clue what's going to happen. I mean, I don't think anything's going to happen right now, but right now you don't have Anthony Davis, and it's going to be a tough time for the Lakers to win games between Russell Westbrook and LeBron James, just not really figuring things out. And I'm just, I do not want to talk about this team. They're just irrelevant. They're not going to be consistent, even if they get Anthony Davis back. They're not used to playing their three stars in the court together at all. They've not found any consistency. They've not found anything that works consistently. This team is irrelevant, and yeah, I just don't know why people even talk about this team pretty much at all. The only thing interesting them about them is the drama and LeBron James potentially leaving before his contract's even up. Like, that would be pretty crazy. But otherwise, there's nothing to talk about here. This team is a non-factor in the Western Conference. The Spurs, maybe they potentially jump into the playoffs. DeJounte Murray is going ballistic, which is their storyline. They could really make the best case in the Western Conference to take the Blazers' play-in spot. With the Blazers, you know, they're going to drop out, obviously. Uh, but the main thing with them is they've just not been consistent, especially for being like a, a team coached by the legendary Greg Popovich. It's just not been that same consistency that they've found in the past. And maybe this is Pop's last ride, or maybe next year's, but uh, just Pop has really dropped off recently. He's just not been able to find the same kind of like niche in the NBA where the Spurs have been successful. Maybe it's due to talent, maybe it's due to how the league has evolved, but the Spurs have not stepped it up uh, in the ways Pop needs them to. But the John Zimmer has really done, done some great stuff. Keldon Johnson's up there as one of the team, the league's best three-point shooters in terms of three-point percentage. And the rest, of the, the rest of the team is kind of filling in, but kind of not. Because, you know, there's a reason why they're 11th in the Western Conference. But Spurs got a chance to maybe jump into the playoffs. You know, getting to the play-in spot is going to give you the opportunity, of course. The Knicks at 21. Winning. They cannot do that consistently. Julius Randle's really cooled off. Tom Thibodeau obviously should not have been named coach of the year with how bad of a coach he's been. And he should, which the word of should have gone to Monty Williams as everyone knew it should have. And they, the thing about this Knicks team, they can't find consistency. They cannot win basketball games. And they don't ever use any of their young talent that just looks really great uh, between Deuce McBride, uh, Quentin Grimes, and Emmanuel Quickly. They just not use those, those players. And it's just confounding. Like, how the heck are you going to not use these guys who look amazing? Like, they, those guys are just clearly very talented players, and the Knicks just refuse to use them. I, I think Grimes has gotten a lot more run, but not using quickly McBride sitting in the G League. Like, dude is dominating the G League. Like, he's unstoppable in the G League. Why is he not on an NBA team? It's very confusing with the Knicks, and yeah, they've got issues. They've got a lot of issues. A lot of them. I don't know if they're even making the play in game. Yeah, that's a bad situation to be in. The Pelicans at 22, the storyline is Zion, but Zion might not even matter this season because he's probably going to be injured for the rest of the season. So let's just talk about players who are there. I think it's about finding a rhythm between these ball dominant players like Brandon Ingram, CJ McCollum, and Devonta Graham going forward. Also getting the ball to Jonas Valanciunas, but that's pretty easy with his pick and pop type stuff. Uh, Herb Jones has also been amazing. As I said, that was one of the guys that was the highest on out of that draft class. And yeah, he's been great for the Pelicans. I'm not totally surprised by that. The main thing I'm surprised by is him actually knocking down threes at a pretty, pretty consistent rate. Like, 
man that's uh that's some great stuff like he's actually hitting threes bringing that defense that i really expect to see out of him playing that big car but that big guard position he's been amazing he's making a legitimate all rookie first team case despite being like a second round draft pick and pelicans have looked pretty solid they just got to find more consistency saw a lot of stuff in my timeline today about potentially signing Ho jose alvarado to a big like four-year contract i don't know i don't know if people watch my channel even know that much about the pelicans but maybe they should maybe they shouldn't i don't know a ton about alvarado but yeah pelicans the kings at 23 we're also going to question their winning ability the kings they've got some talent i think they've got a lot of guys who can win basketball games on their roster between fox steven chenzo barnes uh barnes chemizi matthews looked solid uh, Doma, uh, Domas, you just traded for Domas, and you've got Rashawn Holmes, you've got Terrence Davis. You've got guys who can win basketball games. It's just, it's not put together. I don't think the coaching is there to win games, and there's really no time for them to gel. They're already 13th in the Western Conference, and I really see the Spurs and Pelicans stepping it up, trying to get into the playing game. So I don't know if the Pelican, the Kings can surpass them. They do have a long All-Star weekend where I think none of their players were at All-Star weekend. Like zero of them, from what I recall, were at any of the events involving the uh, All-Star break. So hopefully they've got a long time to practice and get better. But I don't know. I still don't see this team looking that great. The Blazers at 24. It's going to be, it's just the two things. Anthony Simons has looked amazing. Dame, when is he coming back? And this entire roster sucks outside of Josh Hart and the other two, Simons and Dame. There's not a whole lot to say about the Trailblazers. They're going to drop out of their play-in spot, and it's as simple as that. They're going to be out of their spot. Pacers at 25 is going to be looking at Tyrese Halliburton and Jalen Smith at the four because they've been fantastic in the first three games they've played so far. I mean, Smith struggled a bit against the Bucks when he started against Giannis, but... When he's not starting against Giannis, I think he's going to be looking pretty great. Uh, but the real question is, what does this team look like with Miles Turner back? And, you know, Isaiah Jackson, he's looked pretty good. So how's he going to compete against Miles Turner? Who knows? But Halliburton's looked great. Jalen Smith has looked great. And they've clearly done some great stuff at the trade deadline to improve their team going forward. The Wizards, the storyline is going to be Denny Avdia because they've got the worst point guard rotation in the entire NBA. And they're not going to win a whole lot of games with Bradley Beal out. So you've got to focus on Denny Avdia giving him touch as a, as a guard. And this man is just by far the most talented guy on the roster, not named Bradley Beal. Like, I don't see how they can't focus on him yet. Like, you need to focus on Denny. He's clearly the best player on this team. And I'm really hoping they do because there's not a whole lot else to say about this Wizards team. There's just not a whole lot going on. The Thunder at 27. Storylines Josh Giddy's triple double streak. He's gotten three straight games of triple doubles. That is a running streak, so he could just go into the next game and continue that streak. But otherwise, you know, SG has been out for most of the season. Thunder have been winning a few games. Honestly, I don't know how, but they've been grinding them out. They've been pushing hard, and they've been winning games uh, despite being a bad talent team. They're still doing it. Uh, Trey Manns looked very good. A rookie that I was very high on has looked very good for the Thunder. And yeah, they've won a few games. They've gotten ahead of these other teams. They're number four in the lotto odds and not much else to say about them. Now the Pistons at 28, the storyline is Cade Cunningham. He looked amazing and they just need to let him ball out and just be the amazing guard that he is instead of like holding him back and trying to make him into a team player. I've always said that with Cade Cunningham since the second he got into the Pistons roster, you cannot let him be just passive Cade Cunningham. I said that the entire time he was at Oklahoma State too. You cannot let him be passive. He needs to be ball dominant. He's insanely talented. He needs the ball in his hands a lot. And, you know, when he has had the ball in his hands a lot, it's had a lot of great results for the Pistons. Currently got the number two lottery odds, but I think that's going to change with how good Kate Cunningham has been. Uh, the Rockets at 29. It's just going to be about playing the young guys and tanking. Uh, they've just got a very poor roster. Uh, the storyline is going to be seeing how Jalen Green and Kevin Porter Jr. perform for the rest of the season uh, because those two players have been questionable at times. I, I think they've still got a lot of upside and still a lot of potential to do great things in the future, but right now, they've both not looked very good, and I don't know if they can play together going forward either. Finally, the, ma the Magic at 30. Are those ACL tear players going to ever come back this season? It's been more than a year since I think they've lost both... Uh, Mark Hill Fultz and Jonathan Isaac. So hopefully they're back soon because, you know, they're really 
create players that the Magic could use, particularly John Isaac, very useful player. And their their main guys have been inconsistent. Like uh, Jalen Suggs looked great versus the Suns. Mo Bamba had a particularly amazing game against Joel Embiid and the Sixers, but they've been very inconsistent. Finally, maybe Franz Wagner makes another push for Rookie of the Year. Like he could legitimately win it. And that's it. It's 30 minutes for 30 teams. Uh, that's a long video. Back to back days with long videos. Ooh, that's a lot. I um, shouldn't have paused so much in the beginning. Probably could have been a shorter video, but. Yeah, that's it. Uh, thanks for watching. If you made it all the way to the end and you aren't already subscribed, maybe go hit subscribe because you probably want to see more content if you made it all the way to the end of a 30 minute video. Go hit subscribe. Go do it. Please help me out. Anyways, I will see you in the next one. Goodbye.